In the last lesson, we found that a current in a conductor produces a magnetic field around it. This is the same as saying that a moving charge produces a magnetic field in a region that surrounds the moving charge. Now, today, in this lesson, we will talk about the magnetic field due to a moving charge and see how we can measure it. So, a moving point charge is equivalent to an electric current. So, if an electric current produces a magnetic field, a moving charge should also produce a magnetic field. Uh, this demonstration we saw in the last class, how a magnetic field exists around a current carrying conductor. Now, what we're going to do is, we're going to obtain an expression for the magnetic field B at a point distance R from a moving charge where V is the velocity of that charge and how big is the electric field produced at a distance R. So, we say the magnetic field B at a point distance R from a point charge Q that is moving with the velocity V is directly proportional to the quantity QV. It is proportional to the amount of charge and it is proportional to the speed of the charge. And it is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the moving charge. Now you must understand that the direction of the moving charge and the point where we find the electric field, if, that, if the line joining the point to the direction of the electric field makes an angle of 90 degrees, then the magnetic field will be a maximum there. But if the angle is different, then we got to take the component that makes it the maximum. So we can write this as B equal to a constant. Now, at the moment, just understand this as a constant. If uh, B is proportional to QV and inversely proportional to R squared, then B equal to a constant times QV over R squared, where mu zero over four pi is a constant. Now, mu zero is a very important constant in magnetism. It is called the permeability of a magnetic medium. Now, R is a vector that points from Q to the point where B is determined. Now, let's draw a diagram and see how that looks. Now, here we have a moving charge that moves with a velocity V. That's a moving charge Q and it has a velocity V. If you now draw a vector from Q to the point where you want to find the magnetic field, this vector is that R. So R is a vector that points from the charge to the point where you measure the magnetic field. All right. Now, mu zero, as I said, is called the permeability of free space, and it has a value given by mu zero equal to four pi times 10 to the negative seven Tesla meter per ampere, which is the same as four pi times 10 to the negative seven Newton per ampere square. Now, as I said to you earlier, the magnitude of this magnetic field produced by this moving charge at a point also depends on the angle that this vector makes with the direction of motion of the charge. Now, the direction of motion, now here, this is the direction of motion, the direction of the velocity, and this is the R vector. Therefore, the angle between these, you can actually extend this and measure that angle. That's the angle theta. So, 
the magnetic field at a point due to a moving charge also depends on the angle between the velocity vector and the r vector and therefore we can put this together and write the expression as b equal to 10 to the power of negative 7 where does this come from remember mu zero is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 tesla meter per ampere so if you divide 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 by 4 pi you get 10 to the negative 7 so it is 10 to the negative 7 qv over r squared times sine theta where theta is the angle made by the velocity vector with the r vector all right let's do a small problem a point charge of magnitude 4.5 nanocoulomb is moving with a speed v equal to 3.6 times 10 to the 7 meter per second along the line y equal to 3 now i have shown it to you here y equal to 1 2 this is the line y equal to 3 and the charge is moving along that line with this velocity find the magnetic field at the origin we need to find the magnetic field at the origin produced by this charge when it is at the point negative 4 3 so at the instant when the charge is here what is the magnetic field produced at the origin well the first thing we need to do is to figure out the length of the r vector how do you do that well if you look at the x value and the y value the r vector is the hypotenuse and therefore we can say r equal to square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared equal to 5 meter now we also want the angle theta angle theta is the angle between the velocity vector and the r vector and this is the angle theta and our expression contains sine theta so what is sine theta if this angle is theta then this also is theta sine theta is opposite side divided by hypotenuse so sine theta is 3 divided by 5 that is 0.6 and therefore b equal to 10 to the power of negative 7 q v over r squared sine theta we now have all these values so simply plug them in and simplify that will be 10 to the negative 7 q is 4.9 nano coulomb so there is a small printing error here it must be 4.5 times 10 to the negative 9 times the speed is 3.6 times 10 to the 7 times sine theta divided by r squared and that gives you 3.89 times 10 to the negative 10 tesla is the magnetic field now what is the direction of this field remember the magnetic field created by a moving charge will be at right angles to both the velocity vector and the r vector and the velocity vector is in the y direction and the r vector both v and r are in the xy plane which means when the b vector is at right angles to both v and r it must be a z vector it is in the z direction therefore we use the unit vector k b is therefore negative is 3.89 times 10 to the negative 10 tesla k it is directed in the negative z direction all right now we will look at the magnetic field due to current in a straight wire we had talked about in the last class when a current exists in a straight wire a magnetic field is generated around it and we talked about the right hand rule to find the direction of the magnetic field is that right now we will now obtain an expression for 
the magnetic field generated at a particular point when a current flows in a conductor like this. All right. Now, since current is caused by the motion of electric charges, it is obvious that the wire carrying a current will have a magnetic field. We have already seen that. Now, let's start by considering a small length dl of a conductor carrying current, say, in the direction that is uh, positive z, let's say. Now, this is the conductor that is carrying current up, and this is the small element dl, and we want to find the electric field at a point, say, somewhere here, due to the current in this small length dl. All right? So that's the direction of the current. Consider a small length dl of a current carrying conductor that carries a current I in this direction. Now, let's say a point P, we want to find the magnetic field here, such that the distance from measured from DL to P is R, which means R is the vector that we have been talking about earlier. So P is a point distance R from DL and the vector R, this is the vector R, makes an angle theta with the direction of the current. Alright? Now this is the angle theta. The, the angle theta is the angle between the direction of the current and the vector R. The magnetic field DB at point P due to the current I in the small segment of the conductor DL is given by the equation. I'm going to give you the equation. I'm not going to derive it for you. It is given by dB, dB, the small amount of magnetic field due to the current in the small element DL. That's why we call it dB. dB equal to mu zero over four pi. Is that familiar? That's the constant term we used in the last case. I DL divided by R squared times sine theta. It's a very similar term that we use for magnetic field due to the motion of a charge, which was QV over R squared sine theta. In place of QV, we have I DL. So, if a current I exists in a conductor, the magnetic field at a point P distance r from a small length element of that conductor and if the distance from that length element to the point P is the vector r and the angle between the vector r and the direction of the current r is theta then the magnetic field is given by mu zero over four pi i dl sine theta over R squared. Now, the direction of this magnetic field is a right angle to both the R vector and the ideal vector. This is also a vector. Now, if both these vectors are in the XY plane, then the magnetic field will be in the Z direction. All right. Now, this equation that we developed is actually developed by somebody called bio and Savaret. So it's called the bio Savaret law. And it is used for finding the magnetic field B at a point distance R from a straight wire. Now, this is the equation we use to find the magnetic field at a point due to a small current element that is current flowing in a very small length dl. You can actually use this and use the method of calculus and since we will not be using calculus for this course I will not be doing that. You can actually use that and show that if you have a long conductor carrying a current I the magnetic field at a distance r from that conductor is given by this expression. 
b equal to mu zero over two pi times i over r. In other words, what that means is, if you have a long conductor, the magnetic field at any point, distance r from the conductor, is mu zero over two pi times i divided by r. All right. Now here, this is the conductor carrying current, and you have the magnetic field all around it. As we talked about, the magnetic field goes into the board on the right side and out of the board on the left side during, using the right hand rule. And the field at any point, distance r from the conductor is given by mu zero over two pi I divided by that distance R. Alright, let's do a small problem. A vertical wire on the side of a building carries a downward current of 12.5 ampere. What is the magnitude of the magnetic field inside the building at a distance of 20 centimeter from the wire? With a direct application of that formula. V equal to mu zero over two pi times I over R. So we got all these values. Mu zero is two pi times 10 to the negative seven. We've got current I is 12.5 ampere and the distance of the point where we want the magnetic field is 20 centimeter, 0.2 meter. And that is 1.25 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. Well, if you have a conductor carrying current and there is a magnetic field around it, what happens if you have two conductors carrying current, say, in the same direction? What do you expect to happen? Well, think about it. Well, here I have two wires almost parallel to each other. Now, I'm going to allow current to flow in both these wires at the same time, in the same direction. Now, suppose the current is flowing that way, my thumb indicates the direction. Can you find the direction of the magnetic field? Now, watch this carefully. I have my thumb in the direction of the current my four fingers are going to wrap the upper conductor look at this it goes underneath the conductor below and over the conductor above so the magnetic field will go towards you below the wire and towards me above the wire can you understand that and how about the lower conductor again the current is in the same direction the magnetic field will be coming towards you below the wire and coming towards me above the wire, isn't it? So, tell me, what about the resultant magnetic field in between the two wires? The field due to the top wire below the wire goes towards you and the field due to the bottom wire above that comes towards me. That means due to the top wire the field goes towards you here and due to the current in the bottom wire the field comes towards me. That means the field produced by the current in these two wires are equal and opposite in between them. The field is therefore very weak. Now there are strong fields above here and below and those strong fields will then push the wire towards each other should result in an attraction force. Is that right? Now, can you understand that? One, once again, the field due to the current in the top wire, below it goes towards you, above comes towards me. The bottom wire, above the bottom wire comes towards me. That means the field due to the two wires is actually equal and opposite in between. They cancel. So there is a weak field in between and strong field on either side. It should produce an attraction. Let's see when I pass the current. I'm using a car battery. 
Only for a short while. Just watch. There you go. One more time. The wires attract each other because the strong fields on the top of the top wire and the bottom of the bottom wires will push the two wires together. All right. I have illustrated that concept in here. Again, the top wire, the field goes into the board and out of the board. Bottom wire into the board and out of the board. A weak field here, strong fields on either side. And now, we have already learned that if you have a current I flows in a long conductor, the field produced at a distance R. So if R is the distance between these two wires, the field produced by the current in the bottom wire at a point on the top wire will be mu zero over two pi times I divided by R. So the bottom wire will produce a force, uh, produce a magnetic field V equal to this much at every point on the top wire and the current in the top wire will produce the same amount of field at every point in the bottom wire. Is that right? Okay. Now, the force exerted by the bottom wire on the top wire equal to F equal to ILB where I is the current, L is the length, and it's the magnetic field produced by the bottom wire on the top wire. So the, the force exerted by the bottom wire on the top wire will be I times the length of the wire times B, which is the field produced by the bottom wire and the top wire. And therefore, what is the force per unit length? If this is the force on a length L, then the force per unit length is this F divided by L, and that's equal to I times B. And what is that B equal to? What is the magnetic field produced by the current in the bottom wire uh, at a point at the top wire? It will be mu zero over 2 pi times I over R. So we replace that B by mu zero over 2 pi times I over R. And that will give you mu zero over 2 pi times I squared over R. This is a measure of the force per unit length of this wire. So as a result, each wire will experience a force. So the force per unit length on the top wire due to the bottom wire is this quantity. Also, the force per unit length on the bottom wire due to the current in the top wire is the same thing. Mu zero over two pi times I over R squared. Now, here again I have shown you the illustrations and uh, look at this. If the current is both out of the board, then you have a region of, lo well, low magnetic field, and the, the strong magnetic fields on either side will push the wire towards the weak magnetic field. On the other hand, what happens if one wire carries current in one way, and the other in the opposite direction. If both currents are in the same direction, then you have attraction. If the currents are in the opposite direction, look at what happened. If the current in this wire is downward, can you use your right hand rule to find the, magnetic, the, the direction of the magnetic field? When the current is down, look, look, at, look at my fingers, my the lines of force goes into the board on the left and out at the, at the middle. And on the other wire, again, hold your thumb up. My fingers go into the board on the right and out in between. That means 
the field due to both these wires come out of the board between the two wires. That means the field strength will be very high in between. As a result, because of the field lines are very close to each other in between the two conductors, they repel and the conductor will be repelled away. Now, it's rather difficult for me to demonstrate when I'm doing it on my own to let the current flow in the opposite direction, so I'm not doing it. Uh, just have to understand this and believe that it will happen. All right. Now, if the current in the left wire is I1 and the current in the right wire is I2, suppose the magnitudes of the currents are not the same. Well, if the magnitudes of the current are the same, then the force on each conductor will be mu zero over two pi times I squared over R. On the other hand, if the two currents are not the same, if the current in this conductor is I1 and that conductor carries a current I2, then the force per unit length on each conductor will be, what change will happen? I times I, I squared, will be replaced by I1 times I2. So, the force per unit length will be mu zero over two pi, I1, I2, divided by R. And this is the force per unit length when the currents are not exactly equal. All right, let's do a problem. A horizontal wire carries a current of I1 equal to 80 ampere. A second parallel wire of mass per unit length 0.12 gram per meter is situated 20 centimeter below it. What must be the current on this second wire so that it doesn't fall due to gravity? Well, think about this problem. Now, here is the situation. We have a, a horizontal wire carries a current of 80 ampere and a second wire is 20 centimeter below it. What we need to uh, find is what must be the current on this wire. We're going to call it I2. What must be the value of I2 so that this wire will not fall due to its weight? Well, what we have to do is, in order that this wire may not fall due to its weight, there must be an equal force applied upward due to the attraction between these two wires. In other words, the force per unit length between these two wires must be balanced by the weight of the unit length of that wire. Now, to do that, we have been told that the mass per unit length of the wire is 0.12 gram per meter. If you take one meter of that wire, it will have a mass of 0.12 gram. That means you can now find the weight if you multiply that by G. Once you know the weight of this wire, equate it to the force of attraction between the two wires, which is mu zero over two pi, times I1, I2 over R squared, and then solve for the unknown. Is that right? All right, let's do that. So we got the current I1 equal to 80 ampere. I2 we need to calculate, and the force per unit length of the bottom wire is 0.12 gram per meter. And you know that the force per unit length is given by mu zero over two pi I1, I2 over R. And let's put all these values. Mu zero, I1, I2 we do not know. Two pi times R, the distance between the two wires is 0.2 meter. And simplify that that gives you 8 times 10 to the negative 5 I2. And this is the force per unit length of the bottom wire due to the top wire. In order that this may not fall, this force must be exactly equal to the weight. Now, what is the weight 
of 1 meter of that wire? Well, it's 0.12 gram per meter. Convert the gram to kilogram and then multiply by 9.8. So that will be 0 0.00118 newton per meter. One meter of this wire has this weight. And now, in order that the wire may stay without falling, this force per unit length must be equal to this weight per unit length. So we equate that and solve for I2, and that gives you I2 equal to 15 ampere. Now, you must work out these on your own. Don't just listen to me. You must be, you must be working with paper and pen when you watch these lectures. All right? Now, this actually takes us to the opportunity to define what an ampere is. You see, we, so far we said the current is measured in a unit called ampere. But how much current is one ampere? We don't know. You see, every unit, when you say the length is one meter, you have an idea what that is. When you say the force is one newton, you have an idea how much that is, don't you? When you say the current is one ampere, how much current is one ampere? That's what uh, we're going to do now. And the force between two wires, when these wires carry current, is a good opportunity for us to define one ampere. So the force between two wires is, is used to give an exact definition of the ampere, which is the unit for measuring current. Now, you know that the force per unit length, when two wires are separated by a distance r, if the top one carries current I1, the bottom one carries current I2, then the force per unit length on each of the wire is given by this relation. F over L is mu zero over two pi I1, I2 over R. Now, we want to define ampere. So, look at the way I'm going to do that. Let's say I1 equal to I2 equal to 1 ampere, all right? When I1 equal to I2 equal to 1 ampere, and if R equal to 1 meter, that is the two wires are separated by 1 meter. Now, if that is the case, then force per unit length on each wire will be mu zero over two pi times one, isn't it? Because we have chosen I1 equal to I2 equal to one ampere, and the wires are separated by one meter. So when I1 equal to I2 equal to one meter, R equal to one meter, and then mu zero equal to four pi times 10 to the negative seven tesla meter per ampere, then this F over L becomes, look at that, that's mu zero, and that's our two pi. I1 is one ampere, I2 is one ampere, R equal to one meter. And that will be exactly two times 10 to the negative seven Newton per meter. The value of this is two times 10 to the negative seven Newton per meter. What that tells you is that, if each of these wires carry a current of one ampere each, and if they are separated by one meter, then the force between them will be exactly the force per unit length. The force per unit length on each of the wire will be exactly this quantity. And so how will you define that one ampere then? Now, this is how we define it. Watch it carefully. One ampere is defined as that current when flowing in each of two long parallel conductors separated by one meter results in exactly a force of two times 10 to the negative seven Newton per meter 
of the length of each conductor. So, if I have uh, two long conductors and I have equal currents flowing in them, they are separated by one meter, and if the force per unit length on each of this conductor is this value, then the current in each conductor is one ampere. That is the definition of one ampere of current. All right. Let's now look at the magnetic field at the center of a circular loop. In other words, you have a circular loop like this. What is the magnetic field at the center of the circular loop? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take, break this into very small element each of length dl. And you know that when current I flows, in a small length dl, the magnetic field at a point distance r from it will be i dl sine theta divided by r squared, isn't it? That's the rule that we have talked about earlier. So, in order to find the magnetic field at the center of a circular loop, we take a small current element dl here of now, the, the loop has the radius r. We take a small current element IDL. Now, you see, this is called the current element because I is the current flowing in it, and DL is the small length, and I times DL, we call that current element. Now, what is the magnetic field produced by the current I flowing in that small element? at the center B. That is what we want to find. All right? Now, the magnetic field DB at the center due to this current element is, we already know that, mu zero divided by four pi, I DL sine theta divided by R squared. Now, what is the angle theta? Angle theta is the angle between the direction of the current and the R vector. And in this case, because it is a circular path, anywhere you take that DL, the angle between the direction of the current and the R vector will be 90 degrees. And therefore, sine theta is 1, isn't it? Yes. So, the Theta is the angle between the current element and IDL, and since in this case it is 90 degrees, then dB can be written as, sine theta is 1, so dB can be written as mu 0 over 4 pi times IDL over R squared. Now, this is the measure of the magnetic field produced at the center due to this element. Now, we can take, similarly, a hundreds of elements all over this conductor in the form of a circular ring. And then the total field at the center will be the sum of all these. That's a very simple thing to do. So the total field at the center is obtained by adding all these dB values around the ring. This, I, uh, this dB plus this dB plus this dB. So we go around and add all these. So we say the total field B equal to summation of dB and summation of dB. And if you notice, mu zero I over four pi R squared, that is all a constant. I actually need an equal sign there. So B, the total field is, we sum up all dBs. Can you put an equal sign there when you watch it? Equal to, we add up all these dB values. Now, remember, mu zero is a constant. I is a constant. 4 pi is a constant. R, the radius of that conductor, is a constant. So, we can take that out. We mu zero I over 4 pi squared then sum of all the dl's. 
What's the result of adding all the DLs? Adding all the DLs around a circle gives you the circumference of the circle that is 2 pi r. So summation of DL is simply 2 pi r. All right? And now replace summation DL by 2 pi r and cancel the common factors and what do you get? The magnetic field at the center of a circular loop of wire that carries a current I is mu zero I over 2R where R is its radius. All right, let's do a problem. One quarter of a circular wire loop carries a current I find the magnetic field at O, the center of the circular coil. That's not really a problem. If you know the total field produced by the entire loop, then the field produced by one quarter of that will be a quarter of the whole thing. So, I'm going to leave it for you to read the PowerPoint. Now, this is the quarter of uh, the complete loop and uh, the current, the IDL, the magnetic field DB produced at this point can be written as, as we did earlier, DB equal to B0 over 4 pi IDL over R square, sine theta is 1, as a usual argument, and uh, what all we need to do is add up all these dBs for the quarter of the loop. Now again, mu zero over four pi i over r squared is a constant. And so what all we need to do is keep that separate and add up the dLs. This time, adding all the dLs in a quarter of a circle is one fourth of two pi r. Is that right? That's right. So that would be two pi r divided by four. Summation dl is two pi r divided by four, and that gives you the field at the center of that loop is mu zero i over eight r. Magnetic field at a point on the axis of a circular loop. Now here, what we have done so far is to find the magnetic field at the center of a circular loop. Now, what we want to do here is, this is a circular loop and this is the axis of it. We want to find the field at a point, say where I'm holding here with my finger, I need to find the magnetic field at this point on the axis of this coil. All right, let me see if I can draw that diagram for you. This is the circular loop, and this is the axis. I want to find the magnetic field, say, at this point P, due to the current in here. We take the same approach. Take a small current element IDL, and find the magnetic field at P due to that as mu zero over four pi ideal sine theta over R squared. All right? So P is a point on the axis of the circular loop, a distance X from the center. That's very important. That is the, gives you the location of that point. Now, we take a current element ideal and find the magnetic field dB at P due to that current element. And what is that equal to? It'll be mu zero over four pi I DL over R square sine theta. What is the value of theta? Now remember theta is the angle between the direction of the current and the R vector. Now here this is the R vector. Knowing that for a circle, the angle between that line and the, the length DL will be a right angle, 90 degrees. And therefore, sine theta is 1. You have dB 
equal to mu zero over four pi i dl divided by r squared. Now, this r is actually determined by the radius of the circular, the circular loop and the distance of the point P from the center. The, the uppercase R is the radius of the loop of wire and X is the distance of the point from the center. Therefore, R squared equal to big R squared plus X squared. So let's replace this R squared by this quantity. So we get dB equal to mu zero over four pi I DL divided by R squared plus X squared. Now what is the direction of this field? Well, let's say the direction of dB is somewhere there. That means it has an X component and a Y component. Well, if, uh, if you know the angle there, if this angle is theta, then the x component will be db cos theta and the y component will be db sin theta. So db has an x component dbx which will be db times sine of that db times cos of that angle, is that right? dbx is db cos theta and it has a y component dby which will be db sin theta. Well, now, if you take a similar current element, say, diametrically opposite, in other words, we, we took a current element here, and we got the field at P as dB, and this dB has an X component and a Y component. If you now take a current element at the bottom, exactly opposite, you will get db to be in this direction which has an x component and a y component let's draw that so what happens is the all the y components will actually cancel because a y component this way will cancel with the y component that way only the x components Will, will actually survive. So, all these X component, all these Y components will cancel because if you consider a point, say here, a Y component that way and a Y component that way will cancel, a Y component this way and a Y component that way will cancel. So, all around, all the Y components will cancel only the X components will survive. Now, some time ago I said if this angle is theta, then the X component is dB cos theta. But we don't know that angle. The only angle we know is the angle R makes with the horizontal, that is this angle. We know it because we know R and X, we can find that angle. Now, if you look here, this angle is the same as this angle and therefore dby is db cos theta and dbx is db sin theta it is because it is this angle that we know and so we got dbx is db sin theta and what is sin theta from this diagram sine theta is opposite side divided by hypotenuse and you know that r r squared equal to big r squared plus x squared therefore r equal to square root of r squared plus x squared sine theta is opposite side divided by r which is uppercase r divided by square root of r squared plus x squared that is db sine theta. db sine theta is the horizontal component of db. Now, we can now rewrite it as, look at this, r squared plus x squared times square root r squared plus x squared is r squared plus x squared to the power of 3 over 2 
and we can combine all those terms together leaving that DL alone. And now to find the total field that P due to the current in the entire loop there, what all we need to do is sum up all these dB values. So the total field B will be this quantity times summation of DL. And that will be mu zero I over four pi times R squared plus X squared to the power of three over two times summation of DL is the length of the circular, the circular loop that is two pi R. All right. And uh, I have simplified it as mu zero i r squared divided by two times r squared plus x squared to the power of three over two. You don't need to know how this is derived. You only need to know this. If I give you a problem, you must be able to use that to solve. All right. Now, if this x is very large, compared with this R, we can do an approximation. So, when X is very large compared to R, R squared plus X squared, R squared can be considered to be zero because X is very large. And then it will be X squared to the power of three over two, which will be X cubed. So, we can now write as an approximation B equal to mu zero I R squared over two X cubed. That means if you have a loop of wire like this and a current I flows in it, the magnetic field at a point very far away from it is mu zero I R squared divided by two X cubed where X is the distance of the point from the loop of wire. All right, let's do a problem. A single loop of wire of radius five centimeter carries a current of 3.2 ampere. What is the magnitude of B on the axis of the loop one at its center? We have defined an expression for that. 2.5 centimeter from the center. 2.5 centimeter is not very large. That means we got to use the exact formula that we just derived. And 75 centimeter from the center. Because the radius is 5 centimeter, 75 centimeter is fairly large. We can use the approximate formula. So the field at the center of the loop is given by B equal to mu zero I over two R. That's the expression we defined earlier. And we use all those values that gives you 5.4 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. In the second case, we need to find the field at a point on the axis. Well, on the axis, which is 2.5 centimeter from the center. Actually, in the problem, I made a small error there. It must be one centimeter. It doesn't matter, but because in the solution I used one centimeter, so correct this as one centimeter from the center. So field at a point on the axis one centimeter from the center is given by, this is the exact expression we defined just in the previous slide. So in this case, x equal to one centimeter, r equal to five centimeter, and all the other values we know. So we got mu zero, four pi times 10 to the negative seven tesla meter per ampere. I is 2.6 ampere. R squared is 0 0.03. Well, I have made actually a couple of errors here. I want you to correct this. The radius is five centimeter. So that would be 0 0.05 squared divided by two times 0 0.05 squared plus x squared point zero one squared. So do this on your own using these values and correct all these misprints in here. All right? And I'm gonna leave it for you and check if this is actually right. And field at 
uh, the magnetic field at a point 75 centimeter, we can actually use the approximation. What is the approximate formula? Will be mu zero i r squared over two x cubed, where x is 75 centimeter. And you notice again here for r I have used 0 0.03 meter. It has to be 0 0.05 meter. So now all these it really doesn't matter, but you work it out on your own. The idea here is. Can you use the concepts to solve simple problems like this? Okay, let's now move on to an important concept called Ampere's Rule. Now, Ampere's Rule talks about the relation between the magnetic field generated around a current carrying conductor and the current. This is a rule very similar to the Gauss's rule in electrostatics. Can you recall what Gauss's rule was? The Gauss's rule said, if there is a certain amount of charge enclosed in a surface, then the net flux, either leaving the surface or entering the surface, is 4 pi k times q inside. That is Gauss's law. Now, this is the law similar to that in magnetic field and current. So let's see what ample Ampere's rule is. The equation for the magnetic field produced by current in a, in a straight wire, if you remember, we did this, is mu zero i over 2 pi r. Now Ampere's law gives a general relation between current in a wire of any shape and the magnetic field it produces around it, the B field. So the relation between the B field and I. And this is the statement. Can you read this and see if you understand it? The Ampere's law states that for any closed loop path, the sum of the length elements times the magnetic field in the direction of the length element is equal to the permeability times what does permeability stand for? mu zero permeability times the current enclosed in the loop now you have uh, let's say this is the conductor and this is a closed loop and that represent say a field line, a closed loop. Now what it says is that the sum of the length element, so if you take a very small length element there, take a small length element and multiply that with the B field in the direction of that length element. Remember there's a conductor carrying current there and since I cannot hold both together, you must imagine here, this correspond to the loop of magnetic field around the wire that carries the current. Now, the rule says, if you take a small length element on that loop and multiply it with the B field in the direction of it and add all such quantities, then it must be equal to mu zero times I. That's what the Ampere's rule says. Now, this is the conductor carrying current up, and this is the loop around there. If you take a small length DL there, you need to take the magnetic field parallel to it. So, B parallel to DL, multiply those two quantities. Take B that is parallel to the length element, and sum it all up, summation of B parallel times delta L or DL and the sum of that must be equal to mu zero times I that is Ampere's rule, very similar to Gauss's rule the net flux leaving or entering a surface is 4 pi k times Q inside that is Gauss's law the sum of 
all the B parallels multiplied by the length elements. If you add them all up, it must be equal to mu zero times the current inside the loop. That's right. Very simple rule. We talked about uh, that. And uh, this is the way we express Ampere's rule. Summation B times DL. The same concept here. B times DL means we take each length element and find the field parallel to it and multiply those two. And then add it all up around the closed loop. And that sum must be equal to mu zero times the strength of the current inside the loop. That's Ampere's rule. Another example. Two long wires are oriented so that they are perpendicular to each other such that one carries a current of 20 ampere in the positive z direction and the other carries a current of 5 ampere in the positive x direction. At their closest they are 20 centimeter apart. Calculate the magnitude of the magnetic field B at the point midway between them. I want you to read this one more time and see if you can understand the picture here. All right, this is the picture. We have two long wires oriented so that they are perpendicular to each other. They are perpendicular to each other like this. Now, one carries a current of 20 ampere in the positive z direction. Now, I have chosen this as the positive x, this as the positive y, and this as the positive z. So, the first conductor is this, carries a current in the positive z direction towards u. And the other is below the first conductor. And the closest approach between them is how much? What is the distance between them? 20 centimeter apart. What that means is this distance between them is 20 centimeter, the closest distance. And the lower wire carries a current in the positive x direction. It carries a current of 5 ampere in the positive x direction. Now, let's see how that diagram looks. Now, here you have a the conductor that carries a current in the z direction it comes out of the board and the lower one carries a current in the x direction and uh, the distance between them is 20 centimeter calculate the magnitude of the magnetic field midway between them we need to find the magnetic field at this point due to this as well as due to this now remember you take the first conductor, the current comes out of the board and what will be the direction of the magnetic field there? Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to think about it. What will be the direction of the magnetic field at this point due to current coming out? Will be, look at that. Hold your... I hope you can see this. Hold your right hand with your thumb in the direction of the current. Then your four fingers will wrap so that it goes from left to right. Now look at the shadow of my, of my fingers moving on the screen. It goes from left to right. It goes in that direction. That means the field at this point due to the current in the top wire will be an X vector. It will be uh, in the x direction. And how about uh, the field here due to current in this x direction? Again, keep your thumb in the x direction. And if you wrap up, you can see the field here is going to come towards you. It's a z vector. So the field due to current in this conductor is an x vector. And the field due to current in this conductor is a z vector. That's something that you need to understand. The magnitude can be calculated by using the formula. So the top wire carries a current I equal to 20 ampere out of the board or out of the paper. 
in the positive z direction and the bottom wire carries a current 5 ampere in the positive x direction. The field of P due to the current in, in the top wire is in the positive x direction. I explained that to you. And is given by Bx equal to mu i over 2 pi r. So the calculation part is simple. Now we've we got all these values that gives you 4 times 10 to the negative 5 tesla i and that is the field that P due to the current in the top wire. And field that P due to the current in the bottom wire is in the positive z direction as I explained it to you. So it will be a k vector. And again is mu zero i over 2 pi r and the only difference is i in the bottom wire is 5 ampere in the top wire is 20 ampere. So that will be 1 times 10 to the negative 5 tesla and it is in the z direction it is a k vector. So the total magnetic field at P is 4 times 10 to the negative 5 tesla i plus 1 times 10 to the negative 5 k. That's the answer for this question. There you go. That's the, uh, that's the uh, Bx and Bz, well, it's actually coming out of the board but the only way I can do it is, this is not a y vector, it is a k vector. And since these fields are right angles to each other, we can now find the magnitude by using the Pythagorean theorem. So the field B at, the, at P is square root of the square of the x vector plus the square of the y vector that gives you 4.12 times 10 to the negative 5 tesla. Our next concept is magnetic field due to a solenoid. Now what is a solenoid? Now here I have a solenoid. It is a conducting wire wound on a frame and there are a large number of turns in here and one end of the wire is connected to this terminal the other is connected here and if I connect this across a battery what will happen? The current will flow in these coils and a magnetic field will be generated. Don't you think so? Because when current flows in the conductor a magnetic field is generated. So this is a solenoid. A solenoid is made of a current carrying wire which is coiled into a series of turns. Each side of a turn can be approximated as a straight wire carrying current either up or down. Is that right? Now, suppose the current goes into the wire, say here, it goes in. Look at that. On your side, the current goes down. On my side, the current goes up. Current goes down on your side. My side, the current goes up. Can you figure out how the magnetic field will look like? Now, use your right hand rule. It's a very versatile tool. Now, I said on your side the current goes down and on my side the current goes up. So, I'm going to figure out the magnetic field on my side. How? The current goes up. And that means I must hold the conductor with my four fingers, wrap them, means my fingers goes into the solenoid on my right and comes out on the left. So the field lines will all enter in here and come out the other way. The field lines will look like the magnetic field due to a bar magnet. And on the other side the current is down, look at that, the current is down and so again the field lines will go in here and come out. Now, you be active when you watch this, so use your right hand and work this out. So the current goes up on my side, the field goes in to this side and out this way. On your side, the current goes down, look at that, field goes in here and out there. 
So field lines all will be going in and out. The field will look exactly like the field of a bar magnet. Now look at this. That's how the field will look like. The fields will go in on the right and out. So what you notice is that inside the solenoid there is a very strong magnetic field. Right? Now let's see if I can show that to you. Now here I have uh, the solenoid. I have placed an iron needle well next to the inside of the coil. Now see if anything happens when I allow a current to flow in the solenoid. I'm using my car battery so I'll only do it for a fraction of a second. Watch that iron needle. What happened to it? It got pulled inside. Now remember an iron needle it takes a little bit of strength to get it pulled inside. That means a very strong magnetic field is inside the coil and it is that strong magnetic field. Watch it again. There you go. Yes. That's a very convincing uh, experiment to show that the strength of the field inside is... Well, the, the field, the magnetic field inside the solenoid is very strong and you just saw how the iron needle was pulled inside. And the field outside is rather weak. So the solenoid, when it has the current, it acts like a magnet. And in fact, most of the electrical equipment that we use has got electromagnet. The electromagnets are the solenoid that carries a current. Now there are wide applications for this solenoid and we don't have time to talk about those at the moment. Now, using Ampere's rule, we can obtain an expression for the magnetic field inside any point. Now if you look at these field lines, you know that the field at any point inside the solenoid is a constant. And what does Ampere's rule say? That if you sum up all DLs multiplied by the field parallel to DL, if you sum up all around the loop, it must be equal to mu zero times I, where I is the current inside the loop. Now, if we use that, we can show that the strength of the magnetic field at any point inside the solenoid is B equal to mu zero ni, where this lowercase n is the number of turns per unit length. Very important to know that. n is the number of turns per unit length, not the total number of turns. If there are a hundred turns in a length of 10 centimeter, what is the number of turns per unit length? It'll be 100, it'll be number of turns divided by the length. 100 turns divided by 0.1 meter, that will be 1000 turns per meter. So n is the number of turns per unit length. All right, let's do an example. A Thin 10 centimeter long solenoid has 400 turns of wire and carries a current of 2 ampere. Calculate the magnetic field inside the solenoid. Well, the magnetic field is mu zero ni. You got mu zero. What's mu zero? 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 tesla meter per square meter. Now, you got 400 turns in a length of 10 centimeter. So what is the number of turns per unit length? Number of turns per unit length is the total number of turns divided by the length. 400 divided by 0.1. That is 4,000 turns per meter. Well, we have the current I. We know the value of mu zero. Therefore, Magnetic field B equal to mu zero ni and use all those values. That gives you 0 0.01 tesla is the magnetic field at a point inside that solenoid. 
as I told you earlier, a current carrying solenoid is an electromagnet. Now look at this, uh, the solenoid carrying a current and a bar magnet, the magnetic field looks exactly the same. Now, something that would be useful later on, if you know the direction in which the current flowing in a solenoid, can you find the polarity? Well, this is how you, you do that. Now, when you look at the solenoid, let me take this out. When you look at the solenoid, and if the current flows in the counterclockwise direction, then that will be a north pole. If the current flows in the clockwise direction, it'll be a south pole. You've got to look at the solenoid from the side and trace out the direction. Suppose the current goes this way, goes in and comes out. So the current is, uh, the current say is in the clockwise direction. Look at my, how my fingers go. If the current is in the clockwise direction, then that end will be a south pole. If the current is in the anti-clockwise or counterclockwise direction, then that end will be a north pole. We will use this as we go on later on. Now, there is a small part of this lesson left. I'm going to upload it as uh, part B of this lesson, all right? I'm going to close this now. Experienced 